Well, when it comes to talking about heaven, sometimes it is good to use our imaginations. And so I thought this week that it would be good maybe to have some of our young friends at our elementary school help us out a little bit with understanding what heaven is going to be like. And so I asked Kayla Johnson, our kindergarten pre-K teacher, to have her kids share some thoughts about what they thought heaven was going to be like. And I want to share those with us as we start here today. Uh, Little Enzo, one of our kids out at the school, writes, heaven is high in space. And he goes on to say, God, Jesus, angels, and the Israelites live in heaven. Good news for the Israelites today, right? Right? may not have always seemed like they were going to be in heaven in the Bible, but Enzo tells us they are, and that's good news. There are no bad words in heaven, and God can use his powers and create dinosaurs again. That comes from Zachary. So we're going to have dinosaurs and Israelites in heaven, so we're doing good, and we know we're going to have grizzly bears. All right. Heaven is clouds, grass, trees, and flowers, and that comes from Coulter. I don't know if Coulter is here with us today or not. I don't see him. And then Xander wrote, in heaven, people will be nice. That's good news, isn't it? And animals won't attack, which is also good. And then Joshua, heaven is a place where God, Jesus, and the angels are. And then Sophia, I know Sophia is here today. I liked hers. It says, heaven is a cloud with grass growing on it. It has animals and fun stuff. So is heaven going to be good? It is. Thank you, Kayla, and our kindergarten class there for sharing those with us. You know, when it comes to heaven, as I was reading those, I began to wonder in my own mind, you know, what happened to the innocence and the wonder and the imagination in my own life about what heaven was going to be? Have you noticed as you grow older, heaven might become a little less in your eyes? Maybe for some, it doesn't. But I think for most of us, If we were to ask what heaven is like, we wouldn't be using the same descriptions we were using when we were five, six years old. And perhaps heaven has lost a little bit of wonder to us today. C.S. Lewis evidently thought so when he was writing. It says, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. God commands us to be heavenly minded, and in doing so will give us the perspective and motivation to live on earth as he has commanded us to. Interesting statement. Now, somebody probably got hung up on ineffective and thought, oh my goodness, we're ineffective. Well, that's not what C.S. Lewis is saying, okay? This is actually encouragement for us as a church. C.S. Lewis is observing that the world he lives in has lost sight of the wonder of what heaven is. And the world he was writing to had began to see too much wonder and excitement in the world around them. And he says because of this, because of the church is looking more around here than it is up there, he says it's become what? Ineffective. I don't know about you, but when I think about us as God's church, I want to be what kind of a church? Effective. I see this as encouragement for us today to turn our eyes where? Towards heaven. And imagine again and have the wonder in our hearts again of how good heaven is going to be. He says we're commanded in your Bibles, if you turn with me this morning, to Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. We're on page 
1167 in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along there. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not where? On earthly things. See, I think God understood that one of the devil's biggest deceptions in our world today is that by making our world such an entertaining and busy place, that it's easy for us as Christians to get caught up in the excitement and the quote-unquote glamour of the world around us, and we lose sight of heaven above sometimes. And if we do, as C.S. Lewis writes, we aren't as effective as we could be to the world around us. Because our motivation may not be quite the same when our eyes aren't on heaven. And so today we follow the instructions of Paul here. We are going to turn our hearts and our eyes towards heaven. The question that was asked today is, what is heaven like? Your Bibles, flip over with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 21. You'll want to put a marker in there or keep your finger there because we'll be spending a lot of time in Revelation going to a few other places. But we're going to begin to look at what heaven is like. And perhaps in our hearts today, recapture, if it already isn't there, some of the wonder, the magic of what heaven is. It says here, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Paul gets a glimpse of the heavenly city coming down, doesn't he? And it's a glorious thing for him to see, and he describes it a little bit later in Revelation 21. But as he sees it, he is reminded of something. This heavenly city reminds him of what? A bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Jump down to verses 9 and 10 here in chapter 21 of Revelation. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. He says, come, I'll show you the bride of the Lamb, beautifully adorned. And John goes and he sees what? Again, it's the heavenly city coming down. This glorious city that he again will show us is beauty beyond what we can imagine. But he's drawing our minds to something that is very important here. As important as the heavenly city is, John is pointing our attention to who? The bride of the Lamb, which is who? Jesus. This last Monday, right here in this church, I got to perform a wedding. Nobody you know, probably, so don't get too excited. Parents with your kids, oh my goodness. Not me. A couple from Whitehall that in their 70s are, got married on, on Monday. Now, they told me they were on their way to Billings. This was just going to be a very low-key thing. They've been married before, and this is going to be their ultimate marriage. And low-key, we're just going to wear our jeans, whatever. And so, very simple ceremony. We're just going to have a couple witnesses. And so I decided, well, okay, they want to do it at 2. I'll get here about 1230. 
and kind of work on what I'm going to do for their wedding. And I'm here at 1230, and 10 minutes later, there's a knock on the door. There's a whole bunch of people outside the church. Daughters, daughter-in-law, sons, grandkids, great-grandkids. We're here early because we all need to get dressed up. I was just wearing what I normally wear every day, and so I thought, oh my goodness, this could be good. And so, but the daughter-in-law had insisted that the bride wear a dress and the groom wear a suit because they were getting married. When the daughter-in-law speaks, you listen. Or at least that's what I got out of this family situation. <laughs> and so from there on, it was just a bunch of things happening. And we had the wedding here and the bride came out from downstairs and she was wearing this beautiful blue dress. And one of the fun things about being a pastor is getting to do weddings. And one of the awesome things about doing weddings is when the husband-to-be gets that first glimpse of his new bride, they can never stop smiling from that point. Up to that point, they're all nervous and wondering what they're going to say. And it's only I do, but they're worried about it. And then they see the bride and everything changes. They get excited and happy and they can't believe how beautiful their bride is. Right, Chris? I saw your eyes this summer light up when Sarah started coming up the grass walkway. Walter's eyes at 70-something got excited and got a little moist because that was his bride. You remember your bride and how beautiful she was? Not a beautiful picture of what God says about his church. That's what we are to Jesus. Because that's what the church is here. Look at Revelation 19 and verses 7 and 8. Just back a chapter. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And the fine linen stands for what? The righteous acts or the righteousness of the saints. See, I think Jesus is telling us something very important about heaven that we need to get out of the way first and foremost. Is that the greatest thing about heaven is going to be the beauty of God's church and his bride. That holy city that's described there with all of the, (coughs) excuse me, precious stones that make up the wall, those big gates that are pearls, the streets of gold that are like transparent glass. That isn't just to tell us that the heavenly city is going to be awesome and beautiful. That heavenly city represents who? That's us. That's how spectacular and beautiful and wonderful God's church and his children are going to be in heaven and for all eternity. Look in your Bibles with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Keep your finger in Revelation there. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, page 1145. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Some of the wording here will remind us of what we just read in Revelation and also in our scripture reading this morning as far as the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what kind of a creation? A new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. God working on a new creation in your heart right now? It says here, when we come to Jesus Christ, what does he begin to do in our lives? He begins a work, doesn't he? 
When I accepted Jesus Christ into my life, he began a a work of changing Jim from the old person that he was to the new person that God has always wanted me to be. And as I stand here today, and as you sit there today, we are all a work in what? Progress. I hope and pray by the grace of God that God is working in your heart today even in making you a new creation. How many of you are finished? I love the words of Paul. Not that I have arrived. I'm not there yet. But I continue pressing forward, striving to reach out and take hold of what? The prize. See, God's not finished with us yet. But when heaven comes, when we are in heaven, are we going to be a different product? Few of you are, at least. You're nodding your heads. I sure glad I am going to be one. And I know you are too. Just unsure whether you should nod or not. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes again, on that great day of the Lord, as Paul describes it in Philippians, that God is going to finish the work that he has begun. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that when Jesus comes, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, that which is mortal is going to put on what? And that which is corrupt will put on incorruption and righteousness. There is going to be something different about us when we are in heaven than where we are right now. Steps to Christ is a book I love, and one of my favorite passages, paragraphs, just a little sentence out of there, talks about where I'm at right now and where we are at right now. Because in this work that God is doing in our hearts, in this transformation, as we stand before God, it tells us that Jesus in his perfect righteousness stands in my place. And therefore, when God looks at me, he sees me as if I have never, ever, what? Sin. Is that good news? But you know what? Something is going to change when we get to heaven. Because I'm still going to need the righteousness of Jesus, right? But as we read when we studied the 144,000 a few weeks ago, that great multitude is going to be wearing, it says, their robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And like Adam, out of the hands of his Creator, before sin ever entered this world, we will stand before God, innocent and perfect, because this old sinful nature that I carry with me now will be gone forever, because God has finished his what? His work. Does that sound okay or pretty good? I cannot wait to get rid of that old me to not have him day after day trying to slow down the work that God is doing in the new me. There is a battle that is being waged. And when Jesus finishes his work, the battle is what? battle's over. Now, did Adam still need the righteousness of Jesus before sin? Whose image was he created in? God's image which means he was righteous and holy, right? Who made him righteous and holy? God did. Jesus did. In heaven, I'm going to be righteous and holy only because what? Jesus made me righteous and holy. 
by the blood of the Lamb. But like Adam, I'm going to be able to stand before God. No one in between. That's a scary thought right now, isn't it? Would that scare you to stand before God right now without Jesus in between and his righteousness? It is a scary thought. But you know what? We don't need to be scared in heaven because the work is what? It's finished. Great Controversy puts it this way. Jesus opens wide the pearly gates and the nations that have kept the truth enter in. There they behold the paradise of God, the home of Adam in his innocence. Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, Christ presents to the Father the purchase of his blood. Oh, the wonders of redeeming love. The rapture of that hour when the infinite Father, looking upon the ransom, shall behold his image. Sin's discord banished, its blight removed, and the human once more in harmony with the divine. What's heaven going to be like? It's going to be pretty good when I don't have to worry about the old me anymore. And I'm going to stand in complete innocence before my God. As Revelation 21 reminds us in the last verse, never again will sin ever enter in to God's kingdom. Never again will there be anything like that in my heart or yours. And that's really, really good news. But as I think about that, standing there in the innocence like Adam did before God in his created form, I'm reminded of something else. Not only am I going to be spiritually changed, but there's going to be a physical transformation. Because again, I'm made in whose image? In God's image. And the last time I checked, God didn't need these. When I go to heaven, when I'm heading up, the biggest, hottest, fiery patch I can see is going to catch these. And I'm never going to worry about forgetting them again. I'm never going to pick up God's word and have to do this to see again. And some of you may be throwing your hearing aids towards the same place. The last time I checked, God didn't wake up stiff and sore when he got out of bed. God didn't have to go see the dentist and get his wisdom teeth out. God didn't have to go to the doctor. God didn't get a cough in December that's still nagging along in the end of February. We're physically going to be different, are we not? And Philippians says that when I go to heaven, my body is going to be like the glorious body of Jesus Christ after he was resurrected. I'm kind of excited about that. Because Jesus ate, and I'm going to enjoy eating in heaven, chocolate apples right out of the tree. (laughs) And I'm going to enjoy leaving behind all of the stuff that we have physically here when I get there. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more suffering. No more tears. No more death. It's all gone. We are 100% physically again in the image of God. Is that going to be incredible? Again, from the great controversy, in the beginning man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character, but in form and feature. Sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image. But Christ came to restore that which had been lost. Restored to the tree of life in long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full stature 
of the race in its primeval glory. The last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed, and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of the Lord our God in mind, soul, and body, reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. Again, that's going to be pretty cool, isn't it? Remember some of the things Jesus did after he was resurrected? That first night, disciples were locked in the room. Jesus got in without opening the door. I'm going to be able to scare my wife like I never could on this earth. <laughs> Here you have to be real quiet opening the door. I can just go right through and bang. And then, remember when he went back to heaven? He just went. We're going to be able to just what? We're just going to be able to go. It's going to be pretty cool, isn't it? And I can't wait. And you know what? Let your imaginations go. Because I don't care how wild you get, God's going to make it better than you can imagine. It's going to be great to be in heaven. As I was reading this last quotation this week, restored to the tree of life in the long lost Eden. I was reminded, you know what, we're going to be spiritually changed, we're going to be physically changed, but when we get to heaven, we're going to live in a world that has also been made new and has changed. And it's going to be an awesome place. Even back in Abraham's day, It says that he was looking for a city in a country not of this world, but a heavenly city, a heavenly country. He was looking forward to something better. Eden restored, perhaps. I want to take us to the last place we see Eden in the Bible. Show you something that's, I think, pretty cool. Way back in Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. First book in the Bible there, Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And it says there, So the Lord banished him, speaking of Adam, and that, re- <laughs> excuse me, Adam, and that represents Adam and Eve as well. So the Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Verse 24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now we're talking about heaven and some pretty encouraging things today. This isn't very encouraging. This is a rather sad place in the history of the Bible. Adam and Eve are having to leave what? Garden of Eden. Can you imagine what that is like? I remember moving my family from Missoula when we went into pastoring to go up to Haver. I remember what it was like to watch our little kids watch our house disappear as we drove away. It's not a very fun thing to leave home, but imagine leaving Eden. But I want us to notice something that happens here. It says there's a cherubim, a flashing sword, and it's doing what? It says it is protecting, guarding the way to the tree of life. As I read that this week, I thought, you know what? That's interesting. Eden hasn't been destroyed. The way to the tree of life hasn't been destroyed. It's not gone. God's doing what? It says there he's guarding it. Yeah, he might have been guarding it so Adam and Eve wouldn't go back in, but I think there's more to this passage than that. I think God's telling us something. That there is a way that still leads to where? Eden and the tree of life. I was excited then when I went to some commentaries. I found this in Barnes's notes on the Old Testament. He sets his cherubim to keep the way of the tree of life. This paradise then and its tree of life are in safe keeping. 
they are in reserve for those who will become entitled to them after an intervening period of trial and victory. And they will reappear in all of their pristine glory and all their beautiful adaptedness to the high-born and newborn perfection of man. That's kind of exciting, isn't it? Because when we get to heaven, we're going to get to go back and have access to what? The tree of life and the garden that God created, the home of Adam and Eve. Now, I don't think I'm probably going to be quite as excited as Adam and Eve, but I'm going to be right behind them. And you know what? The Bible says that this isn't just something we're guessing at. Revelation 22, the first couple of verses. Flipping back to Revelation, and we'll go quickly here. Revelation 22, the first couple of verses. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. There's still a way open to Eden and the tree of life? There is, isn't there? And Jesus, on the night before he died, encouraged his disciples with that very thought, didn't he? I'm going to prepare a what? place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come back, right? And I'm going to take you to be with me for eternity. And then my favorite part says, in Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way to get there. Isaiah 65 says in that city where our mansions were going to be, Abraham tells us in Hebrews that there is a city, but there's also a country he's looking forward to. Isaiah 65, we're not going to take time to go there today. You can go and read. It's a picture from our scripture reading. We started it today, the new heavens and the new earth. But it says there we're going to build houses when we get to heaven. So I'm picturing that in the heavenly city, God has got me one huge, fancy mansion. And by the way, some of you are worried, is there going to be room enough for my mansion when Pastor Jim gets his in there? Because after all, heaven is only 14,000 miles by 14,000 miles by 14,000 miles a cube, right? 1,400 miles, I think it is. Is there room for that? Somebody did a calculation on a, 5,000 square foot home, single level, that in the dimensions that were given in the Bible, and I probably just messed everybody up, it's one of the two, I think it's 1,400 miles. I said 14,000. But in the 1,400 cubic miles that are there, there's enough room for 10 billion 5,000 foot homes, single level. And I say... I don't want to be on on one floor. I want to have view. So we're going up two or three stories, which cuts down the space. A little math on my part figured out there could be over room for over 100 billion homes, mansions in heaven. So does God have room for you? He does. And that's just in the city. And then the first Sabbath, after we go into the city, and listen to Jesus preach, which is going to be an awesome sermon, by the way. The best one you've ever heard till the next week when he goes and he preaches one even better. And think about that for eternity. They just keep getting better. You'll be so thankful you don't have to listen to me ever again for eternity. But afterwards, on a week when we don't have potluck at least, all of you are invited to my place out in the country. I'm going to fly you all in because you can fly yourselves. It's going to be on one of the highest mountains in all of the new earth. And it's going to be a log cabin. 
Now, it's good that there's transformations happening between here and heaven if I'm building my own house. The closest thing to a house I build is a dog house I built for my dog when I was in high school. It's still up at the pastor's house up in Haver, by the way, in the backyard. It was built to last for eternity. Two by four, two by six, three quarter inch plywood construction. But there is something weird. I put it together and then went <clears throat> to put the plywood on the sides and plywood was square when I got it, but it wasn't square by the time I went to put it on. I don't know what happened to it. I had to cut all of these angles to make it work. So if my cabin looks a little weird up there, you will know that God left my building skills as they were down here. But nonetheless, you can come. And as I mentioned in this children's story, when you get there, again, let your imaginations go. My front yard is going to be filled with grizzly bears. And you're going to have to pet and hug and wrestle your way into my house. And you're going to love every minute of it. My house cat's going to be a mountain lion. Some wise guy in Whitehall said that I would have a bobcat. (laughs) When I thought of bobcats in heaven, it almost made me believe in purgatory. (laughs) Bobcats there, grizzlies up here, but I refrained. (laughs) Pastor Jim might even have a pet bobcat. But isn't that going to be awesome? And we laugh and we think, oh, Pastor Jim's kind of being silly, but you know what? I don't think I'm even getting close to how good it's going to be when we get there. And you know what? It made me feel good this week to kind of let go and imagine again as a kid at what heaven might really be. And I hope today you, in your mind, have let go a little bit and imagined what heaven might be for you. And the only thing I would tell you is, whatever you imagined, it's going to be a whole lot better. And that's what heaven's going to be like. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but I know it's going to be worthwhile if only for one thing. I'm going to be with Jesus for eternity. And the work that's going on here is going to be done. I'm going to be with Jesus for eternity and I'm going to be like Jesus for eternity. And I think For that reason, heaven is worth it, don't you? None of the other stuff happened. I had to live in this same body, get a cold once a year, have aches and pains when I wake up. If I had to live with that for eternity, if I just knew that I was going to be like Jesus every single day perfectly and be with Jesus every single day, that's heaven enough for me but it's going to be better, isn't it? You want to be there today? We're going to bypass our closing hymn today, but the thing I would leave you with, and the prayer that's in my heart, yes, Lord Jesus, come soon, because that's when it all begins, isn't it? But more importantly, I sense in my heart today Lord Jesus, finish the work you've begun.